All right, the children will depart to their class now. As they do, let's begin our time in prayer. God, I ask you to today to uh, tame our tongue. Lord, a lot we speak that we probably shouldn't speak, Lord. Lord, show us the importance of this teaching today that James would include it. The Holy Spirit would include it in your scriptures. Uh, Father, we need for you to speak. We need to be silent more. We need to be still more. We need to stop believing, Lord, that we can see. For Jesus says, then we are blind. Lord, we confess this morning that we are blind unless you open our eyes. So Holy Spirit, come, please, and, and peel back the eyelids of our hearts, Lord, that we can see and apply what's necessary for this week. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Praise God. Thank you, Laura just left, but thank you, Laura, for Bible bag. You know, it's hard to find someone to do Bible bag because you gotta, you got to be creative, you got to be excited, and we found someone besides Carl who can do it, um, which is great. Thank you, Dave, for your worship intro as well. Um, all right, so um, we've been in a series through James. Now, past couple weeks, we kind of took a break. Well, no, we didn't. Uh, uh, Dick preached from James chapter 2, talking about faith versus works. Faith without works is dead. And last week, of course, we had teen and adult challenge here, so we kind of took a little detour. But now we're back to James chapter 3. And so just a little bit of uh, background on James for, for uh, maybe those who weren't here. Um, James is a very short book, just five chapters, and it's very unique in the New Testament. Uh, actually, the book of James would actually fit well with the uh, wisdom literature of the Old Testament, like Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. Uh, and the reason is because it's hard to identify any single theme in James. We get a bunch of different themes or really a bunch of different um, uh, one-liners. Uh, now, chapter th the first part of chapter 3 does talk about taming the tongue. The second part does not. And so uh, it's almost like James has a bunch of bullet points that he wants to get through real fast. And, and so it, 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 there's almost no unifying theme to it. So it's, it's, it's much like the wisdom literature uh, of the Old Testament. So, and, and also different than the book of Romans. So the book of Romans we studied at the beginning of the year, right? Uh, the, the book of Romans was heavy theology. How do we understand Christianity? Uh, James is not that at all. James is not concerned with that. James is simply concerned with now that you have the theology, how do you apply it? How do you live? And so that's unique as well. James is also called a general epistle because he's, it's not written to any particular people, but a, but a group of people called the dispersion. That's in chapter 1, verse 1. In fact, Peter, in his letter, also wrote to the dispersia. And so what those, wh what those were were people that left Jerusalem and were scattered because of persecution. And so obviously receiving a letter from an apostle as they're being scattered, as they're being persecuted, would have been very encouraging. And so that's, that's the, um, the, the recipients of the original letter to the book of James. All right, so as we, you know, you think about, um, or I thought about this week, uh, a lesson on taming the tongue. Kind of seems like there's probably a more relevant message to bring than taming the tongue. You know, Sean, I know, uh, you know, uh, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say it at all, leave it at that, move on. But really, there's something deeper here about uh, the tongue that it does apply heavily, I think, to our, our world right now. So three things I want to talk about today. Is these three things are in your bulletin. I want to talk about, number one, the judgment of the tongue. Number two, I want to talk about the tether of the tongue. And thirdly, I want to talk about the healing of the tongue. The judgment, the tether, and the healing. So let's start then with uh, the judgment. So uh, James begins this section by addressing those who aspire to be teachers in the church, probably pastors, elders, uh, a bishop would be another uh, synonymous term for elder. So he's addressing people, uh, addressing leaders in the church. And he says, not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that those um, who teach will be judged more strictly. James says, for those of you who are aspiring to, be, to, to provide instruction to the church, slow down a minute 
because you need to know what you're getting into, right? And uh, James kind of speaks to potential teachers kind of the way we'd speak to our uh, teenage son who's thinking about joining the military. We'd be like, you know, that's a noble thing, but I want you to pause because I really want you to know what you're getting into, okay? And so James is doing the same thing. He said, for those of you aspiring to be teachers in the army of the Lord, good and well, but before you continue, let me ask you, do you really understand what you're signing up for? Okay. And so James says, we who teach shall receive stricter judgment than those who don't. In other words, those who enlist in the military will face a more dangerous future than those who don't. Okay, so let's talk about how to understand that. Let's talk about what it means. Let's talk about what it doesn't mean, okay? When James says um, teachers will receive a, a stricter judgment, or your version actually may read a greater condemnation, uh, here's, what he, here's what James is not saying. He's not saying pastors, elders, and teachers in the church will be saved by their works. Everybody else in the church will be saved by grace. It's not what he's saying, right? So, you know, uh, Romans, because that, that wouldn't match anything else in the scriptures. Romans 8, 1 says, there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. James is not saying there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus with the exception of pastors, elders, and teachers. They're going to be judged by how well they teach. Yeah, that's not uh, what he's saying. So what is he saying? I believe what he's saying is teachers in the church have been given more knowledge and more understanding than other people. Therefore, more will be required of them in the end. Okay, so you know, we do this with our own children, right? Uh, you know, when, August's, uh, uh, when August gets in a mood and she kicks her older brother Mason uh, for no apparent reason, and Mason in response pushes August so that she falls to the ground and cries, guess who's in the most trouble? Mason, right? He didn't start it, uh, but uh, um, he's in trouble more. Why? Because Mason's older. Mason's, uh, August has received 20 lectures from mom and dad about uh, not hitting siblings, but Mason has received 120 lectures, right? Mason has more knowledge. He has more learning. Mason's been given more, therefore Mason will receive, receive a stricter judgment from mom and dad in the end, right? And so, uh, but th this doesn't mean that, that Mason's, though, in jeopardy of losing his sonship. That's not, that's not the question. Mason will always have a place, but for a while, Mason will be judged more strictly than my other children. Another way to say it is because of what Jesus did for us on the cross, the Christian will no longer be judged for his sin, but he will be judged for what he does with what he's been given. Does that make sense? And so now Jesus said the same thing, right, in Luke uh, 12 with the parable, uh, parable of the waiting servants. Jesus said, the slave who knew his master's will and did not get ready or act in accordance with his will will receive many blows. But the one who did not know it and committed acts deserving of a beating will receive only a few blows. From everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded, and to whom they entrusted much, of him they will ask all the more. All right, so why does James, you think, um, feel the need to say this? And, and I, think, I think it's this. He, he feels the need to say this because he, he wants to really humble the leaders. He wants to humble the leaders. You ever been in the presence of an expert in something? Maybe the bo your boss, you know, did your job before you or something? You feel intimidated, right? Not to mention the fact that the expert in, any, in anything often feels superior. I'm an expert, what do you know, right? This is the danger of any acquired knowledge, spiritual or other, is the danger of pride. And, what, and so what James does, I think, is he inserts a safeguard for the church here. In the kingdom of God, people will be judged more severely according to what they have been given. So those who have been given more will receive a stricter judgment in the end, not for their sins, but for what they did with what they had been given. Given, And this truth, again, is a wonderful safeguard, not just for leaders, but for those whom uh, the, uh, they lead. And so let me give you an example of how this plays out in actuality. Right? So if, you've been, if you have a Bible degree, Maybe you have an MDiv, Masters of Divinity, right? Maybe, um, maybe you've been uh, through your particular denomination's process of ordination. 
Okay, you, you have that background, you have that uh, uh, experience, and, and you're participating in a home Bible study with people who don't have the education you have, have and then one of them in the Bible study says something stupid <laughs> that you know isn't even remotely biblical. Uh, if you don't know that you will be judged more strictly than everyone else there, here's what you say to yourself, uh, and, and hopefully only to yourself. You say, that's so stupid. Have you ever, ever even read the Bible? I hope you never get behind a pulpit. Or you judge what they, their, their lack of knowledge. Okay? But when you know that because of what you've been given, you will be judged more strictly than that person, here's how that same interaction goes. After the stupid comment, you say to yourself, Lord, I know that what she just said is not true, but she's probably being more faithful with what she's been given than I am with what I've been given, so please help me love her and gently help her. That's how that goes. Why? Because you're humbled. And, then, and again, she's probably being more faithful than you with what she's been. So this is a wonderful safeguard in the church that, that leaders know this. A wonderful safeguard. Um, it humbles the exalted. It causes the leaders to be afraid of misleading, therefore to lead very humbly. But it also discourages people from teaching who may not be ready to teach. Okay, And so if you've been a Christian, for anybody here been a Christian for more than five years? More than five years. All right. So then at this point in your life, you've probably experienced the pain of bad teachers in the church. And by bad, I don't mean like uh, they don't have like a style you like. I mean like hurtful. So, uh, um, and usually we are hurt by teachers, pastors and teachers in the church in one of three ways, okay? And, and you've probably experienced one of these by now. We're hurt by pastors who, saw, who taught us before they had control of their insides. So they had personal issues that they still hadn't worked through, right? Uh, they had an addiction that was hidden. They had deep insecurities that caused them to be controlling in leadership. They were skilled teachers, but they were abusive in the home behind closed doors, right? Some of you have been hurt by people who became teachers before they had their insides in check. Okay? The second way we're hurt by teachers, and, and then the reason this is such a helpful safeguard, is... Um, is by pastors and teachers who taught before they really had a handle on Christianity. That was me in my 20s. What happens in these situations is that these pastors and teachers major in the minors. Nobody like that? <laughs> they major in the minors. So they identify some nuance of Scripture that sets them apart from other churches, and they major in that nuance. And so, for example, Reformed churches tend to be guilty uh, in majoring in the fact that they believe the King James Version is the only authorized translation in the Bible, and any Christian that uses any other version than that is just not a Christian. They major in a minor. Okay. Now, other churches major in premillennialism or postmillennialism or amillennialism, and anyone who doesn't hold uh, their same view on the end times, that's what that is, end times theory, uh, is not saved. They major in a minor, makes sense? And so we kind of get off on rabbit trails and wh where's Jesus in all this, right? Now, uh, uh, in the churches of Christ, uh, our particular fellowship of churches, we've been even more foolish than these two, in my opinion, in one particular way. So let's pick on ourselves for a second. Uh, we've said that since Ephesians 5 and Colossians 3 tell us to sing to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord, and since Paul in that passage just did not mention singing with guitars or pianos or drums, it is false worship to worship with musical instruments. To fr and to further our argument, we've said that since we do not see any examples in the New Testament of the early church worshiping with musical instruments, we're not authorized to do so. And so in the vast majority of churches of Christ that you visit worldwide, they worship a cappella. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. We used to worship a cappella. Remember that? Some of you that were here that long ago? We used to worship. Nothing wrong with that. Okay. However, um, in fact, there's something very beautiful about it, honestly. But our teachers have taken two passages of Scripture and taught them to mean something that the original author and the Holy Spirit never intended. It never entered Paul's imagination 
to make that deduction from those passages. And yet we've majored in a minor in this one area. So every I, I feel like, folks, every denomination has this. You want to jump to another denomination? Go ahead. You'll find that, too, in just a different way. Okay? And this can be hurtful. This is why you ought to be slow to be teachers. Why? Because uh, we can so quickly uh, instruct before we really know what we're talking about. Okay? And... Um, I remember, uh, again, I, I used, this was me. I remember in my early 20s, uh, I, um, uh, majoring in the minors was, was so attractive to me because I was an insecure man. I remember it used to feel great to know that our congregation is the only congregation in the city teaching the truth. It felt like I, we had a halo around our steeple that nobody else had, right? And that felt great. That puffed me up. Okay, but what <laughs> I felt special and in, 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 in a subtle way, I felt better than honestly. And what I came to realize as I finally let Jesus heal my deep insecurities was that it is a whole lot more in line with the uh, with the gospel. Um, my papers got out of order. I found it. It's a whole lot more in line with the gospel for me to feel like I'm worse than the least of all God's people than to think I'm the best. And when I could finally take refuge in God's unmerited love for me, apart from anything I knew or didn't know, at that point I could see, I could really see what, a, what was a major and what was a minor in Scripture, and I didn't need to feel set apart anymore. Okay? Someone could say, Sean, you're the worst teacher I've ever heard. And I could reply, I know, please pray for me, because I don't feel like I have any business doing this. But God's placed me here, okay? So, if Jesus, folks, has not healed your deep insecurities, it would be wise to pause in your pursuit of becoming a teacher and do some healing first. Um, and again, some of you have been hurt by pastors and teachers uh, who have not healed their insides or who have not really grasped Christianity yet. yet. And, and, of course, the third way that were hurt by teachers. And the reason I think James puts a strong safeguard here, the third uh, is, is some of you have been hurt by pastors and teachers in the church who were just in it with false motives. They were good at what they did. Maybe they were, had a, a former uh, career public speaking, all right? And they were gifted at what they did, but in truth they were eager to make a name for themselves. And eventually that surfaces, right? And so this is always a danger for any leader at any stage because any leader can actually begin well and, and badly. And so James says, listen, hold up. I want you to know what you're getting into if you aspire to be a teacher. So that's the judgment of the, of the tongue. Do you see that? Those who aspire to teach will be judged more strictly. Now let's talk about the second thing, which is the tether of the tongue. You guys remember the old tether balls uh, we used to play with at recess? I play with those. Did, uh, did schools still have tether balls, or are those too dangerous now? They do. Okay. <laughs> um, so you had a volleyball, Damien. We got one of those. I see. All right. Well, you know what I'm talking about then. Uh, so a tether ball, so you get a volleyball attached to the end of a rope, which is attached to a pole, right? And, you, and there may be a game with it. I don't remember. I just uh, enjoyed hitting the ball around the pole as fast as I could. Um, and so uh, um, what James says in this passage is that your tongue is tethered. Okay? James says your tongue is tethered to a rope, and that rope goes down inside your throat, and is tied to your heart. Now, not the four-chamber pumping heart, but the heart of your soul. Uh, and uh, that's, um, that, that, that's what James says. Your heart is tethered. And James says that depending on what's going on in your heart, the tongue at the end of the tether can do a lot of good or it can do a lot of damage as it spins around this world. And so James starts by telling us the power of the tongue. Listen to what he said again. Verse 3, when we put bits in the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, 
but it makes great boasts. Okay? James says that the tongue is a very small part of the body, but, but it probably has the greatest capacity to do harm out of any other part of your body. Okay? And so here's why I think. Because no, no other member of your body is so tightly tethered to your heart. No other member of your body is so tightly tethered to your heart. Your tongue gives voice, ultimately, to all that goes on inside of you in a way no other body part does. Okay? And so however much we tell ourselves, you know, sticks and stones may break my bones and words will never hurt me. And we tell kids to say that. Kids know better. Uh, the truth is, sticks and stones may break my bones and words will damn my soul. Right? Because, uh, you know, a, 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 a parent has the power to destroy a child through the, uh, and throw the whole course of their, of their child's life off through their words. Okay? Um, so the tongue is powerful. But then he says the tongue is untamable. He calls it unruly. It's an unruly evil full of deadly poison. He says every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but mankind can't tame his own tongue. That's what he says. And so clearly, folks, Jesus is not talking about the muscle of the tongue. Like you don't, you know, take the tongue out of your mouth and put it on a table and now it's an unruly evil. No, it's not what he's talking about. Um, it's not the muscle that James is concerned with. The tongue has the power over us that it does because all of all members of the body, the tongue is the one uh, tethered directly to what's going on inside your heart. Okay? And so Jesus said this, right? You brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you're evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, right? The tongue, yeah, the tongue's like a, the dipstick in your car. You know what the dipstick is? where you check the oil. The tongue uh, is, is the dipstick where you pull up and, and, and you see what's really going on down there. That's what the tongue is, okay? Um, it informs you of what's going on down in the engine. And if you want to, so if you want to experiment with uh, the, uh, of whether or not this is true, if you want to prove that the tongue is tethered to your heart, here's an experiment. Now, I just said you be careful, teachers, what you teach, so I don't actually want you to apply this, but I'm saying this would work. Okay, but don't do it. Lock, <laughs> lock yourself in your house tonight so you can't get out. I don't know how you're going to do that. Press the record button on your phone. Buy yourself a 12-pack of beer and get wasted. Now, don't do that. Okay, but here, this is what it would prove, okay? When you, t when you wake in the morning totally hungover and mad at me for even suggesting this experiment, I want you to listen to the recording on your phone. Okay? And here's what you're going to hear. You're going to hear what your tongue is tethered to. Why? Because nothing else held it back. All your self-control was gone. And you'll likely hear one of two things. Because when people get drunk, the tongue is let loose to completely reveal what it's tethered to. When you listen to the recording, you'll either hear yourself talking about the way you actually feel about people in your life, and it probably won't be very kind, or you will hear yourself talking about the way you actually feel about yourself, and it probably won't be very kind either, okay? I, you know, I was riding with the um, Guilford PD one night last year, and we arrested a guy, a drunk guy, and we put him in protective custody at the, at the jail for the night, and on, on the way to the jail, that man called us every name in the book. I mean, I didn't even recognize some of these. I had to look them up. What does that mean, right? What happened was that his intoxication allowed everything the tongue was tethered to to surface freely, right? This man was mad at the world in his heart, and his tongue proved it, okay? What comes out of your mouth, folks, is an indication, a dipstick, if you will, of what's going on in your heart. And so if some of you, for example have a tendency to swear quite easily. There's probably still some darkness going on in your heart that your tongue is tethered to. Or if you've spoken, if you have a tendency uh, to, to too easily speak sexual innuendos to people almost without thinking, that's an indication of what your tongue is tethered to down in your soul. And listen, folks, your tongue can direct your whole life and your whole body even if you never speak. The truth is we're constantly speaking to ourselves about ourselves or about others all day long, even without opening our mouths. 
And so if deep down, for example, you hate yourself, your tongue will silently speak things like, what's the point of living, Sean? You're good for nothing. You might as well end it all now, Sean. And you better believe that this speaking, if you will, will affect your life, right? Your tongue can affect your life even if you never open your mouth because the tongue refers not just to the muscle uh, that communicates but to the mind that formulates words, okay? And so if your self-talk, as psychologists call it, is negative, negative, negative all the time, this will steer the course of your life, okay? And so what James says here is you can't tame your, t- you can't tame your tongue on your own. No man can tame the tongue. It's an unruly evil full of deadly poison. And, you know, perhaps it's, it's possible to never say out loud those, bu- bu- those bad things, but you will never be successful all on your own at taming the tongue that speaks in your mind, okay? So if you want to test how impossible it is to tame your tongue on your own, you could do this test this week. You, this one you could actually try. Forget the other one, okay? Uh, for the next week, here, here's your test. The next week, do not complain or grumble about anything, even to yourself. For the next week, don't boast about anything. For the next week, do not gossip or repeat any negative information about anyone. (laughs) For the next week, do not put anyone down even a little bit with the tongue of your mouth or the tongue of your mind. For the next week, do not defend yourself. And for the next week, always affirm people no matter what. And at the end of the day tomorrow, when you give up on the task, okay, it will have proven that you can't tame your tongue on your own, okay? So we talked about the judgment of the tongue. We talked about the, ta- the, te- the tether of the tongue. Your tongue is the only member of your body tethered directly to your heart, and therefore, depending on what's going on inside your heart, your tongue can do great damage to others but also to yourself, okay? And then lastly, uh, well let's talk about uh, the, the healing of the tongue. Tim Keller said that uh, the tongue helps tell the difference between a mere profession of faith versus a real possession of faith. The tongue helps tell the difference between a mere profession of faith and a true possession of faith, okay? Everyone can fake what the tongue is tethered to for a while, but ultimately the true condition of your heart will show, okay? In other words, you cannot forever uh, fake the condition of your heart because your, your, your tongue will ultimately give it away. I remember the story of a man, this is kind of funny, who um, he had just recently become a Christian, and his church was excited for him. He's probably in his 30s or so. Uh, he was building relationships with the men in the church, and soon after his baptism, one of the elders of the church asked him if he'd like to wait on the Lord's table. And so in their particular fellowship, that meant that there were uh, men that stood up on front at, at, at the front, and they held communion trays and, 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 and uh, wafer plates, and there would be a prayer, and then they would go past those uh, trays down the aisles, right? So, so here's this man, you know, just uh, recently a Christian, and uh, he's standing up in front of the congregation with about six other men, each of them holding a communion tray. A prayer is said before they actually go to pass the uh, pass it down the first aisle, and as he as the prayer ends and he begins walking to the first aisle, he trips over himself and says, "Oh!" Sh-! And out came the word. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops! That's right, uh, in front of the congregation. Uh, and so there was. There, what, what did that show? That, that show what was still in his heart. Now, of course, the congregation had grace on him. Why? Because he's a brand new Christian. But but eventually, your heart, your your tongue will give it away. In some way, your tongue will give away what's going on down in your heart, okay? And so the solution for this is not to become more self-controlled so that words like that don't slip out in public. That's not what we're talking about. The solution is to continually tether your heart to something new. If you really want to go from a mere profession of faith to a true possession of faith, you must identify what your heart is currently tethered to, and you must tether it to the cross instead. Okay. If your tongue is tethered, for example, to personal success, that's what your tongue will speak. If your tongue is tethered to sex, if that's where your heart really longs, your tongue will speak it eventually. 
If your tongue is tethered to unforgiveness, that's what you will speak. In fact, uh, you, you, you'll, you'll speak down about others. You'll judge others as you're driving. You ever been in a car with someone who does that? Right. Uh, you'll group others into categories and form prejudicial judgments. You'll become increasingly critical of anything you don't like. Over time, your heart can become callous toward people to where you don't trust anybody and you really don't care about anybody because your tongue is tethered to resentment and anger. Okay? In the converse, if your heart is tethered to the unforgiveness of yourself, that's also what you'll speak, right? Your self-talk will remain negative. You'll continue to struggle with depression. You'll, you'll continue to compare yourself to others, always thinking you're worse. And if that negative self-talk continues long enough, you may find justification for killing yourself as people find justification for killing others. Okay? But when your tongue is tethered to the cross, here's what happens. You begin to see through the exterior sins of other people and feel compassion for a heart that is deceived in sin. You begin to think and speak about others in a similar way that God thinks and speaks about you. You begin to look past the hard exteriors and long to know the soul beneath the surface that Jesus died for. You begin to be willing to have grace on people because you see the grace that God's had on you. And when you have grace on people, you begin to speak graciously to people, right? You can listen. You can sympathize. You can actually be used by God to communicate truth to people because people will glean from you that you actually care. When your tongue is tethered to the cross, your view on everything changes. You long for the redemption of people. You begin to love people not for what they do or don't do, but because of who they are. They are made in the image of God, and and every single soul in this city, folks, is of more infinite worth than anything ever created ever before, period. That's what it means to be made in the image of God. When your tongue is tethered to the cross, you can long for the redemption of the gangbanger who's spending 20 years in prison or the guy who just shot up a school as much as you long for the redemption of the corporate executive who's never broken the law. When your tongue is tethered to the cross, you stop speaking about people in categories like rich and poor, black and white, gay and straight, religious and non-religious, Democrat and Republican, educated and 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 uneducated. You stop speaking about people in such irrelevant categories because you see that there are only two types of people in this world. God saved people and God's lost people, and they're both gods, right? And so if you're a Christian today, you can learn to deeply love both because you see that you were once God's lost person too, stuck in your sin, but he came for you, right? When your tongue, folks, is tethered to the cross, then when you get opportunities to teach and preach, the cross is all you want to communicate. You don't care about the minors anymore. You want what's major. You don't care to be known. You just assume, pass on, and be forgotten. When your tongue is tethered to the cross, all you will care about is whether Christ is made known through you. And you'll be able to say things like, never speak my name again. The world will be just fine and maybe even better. But if the name of Christ is not spoken more because of me, everything will be worse. Right? Folks, you, uh, you're gonna, you're, you and I are going to be forgotten one day, Okay? Uh, But may it never be that our ancestors forget Christ because our lives, our tongue, was tethered to something other than our Savior, Jesus Christ. My role as a counselor often is to get people to bring up that which their tongue is tethered to by providing them a safe place to confess it. And maybe that's where you need to start this morning. Maybe you need to start by confessing the dark thing your tongue's actually tethered to. And then maybe you need to confess that you believe in Jesus and that you want your tongue tethered to him and to what he did for you on the cross. And then maybe it's time for you to get baptized in water in that beautiful Christian entrance ceremony. Is your tongue tamed by your Savior on a cross this morning? If it's not, just know that your tongue is untamable otherwise. Okay. 
So what is your next step of faith this morning as you think about the tongue? We're going to stand in just a moment, and we're going to form two lines and uh, come and take the communion emblems. But if there's something that you need to do, uh, some uh, action you need to take, some response, I encourage you to come and, and kneel. Uh, you can uh, come and talk to me. I'll be over here to the right. Maureen, if she's back, she'll be over here on the left. What's your next step of faith? Uh, what does this compel you to do? Let's stand and take communion together.